Greetings. Happy Saturday, 12.30 p.m. And thank you so much for being here, everybody. I am I think we're up to number five. It's quite possible in our 12-part series, Eldership series. Um, and we've had an incredible lineup of people. Yesterday, we had you, Pauline. Thank you so much for your incredible stories and wisdom and um, giving back. It was really fantastic. Um, and we've had Jarap and Jimpa, and we've also had uh, Martin Negro and Nancy Parker. So it's a, uh, what do they call it? A star-studded cast. <laughs> and today we've got, for everybody's listening pleasure, Jackie Bushell, who has been um around for a long time it probably it feels longer than it has been Jackie and I think the reason for that is that you've just done so much <laughs> <laughs> and been so many places and been so committed to cause so um it's deeply delightful to have you here thank you oh it's wonderful to be here it's a brilliant <laughs> idea and Especially thank you from all the community. I'm passing on what I have heard, a lot of great um, stories about you, a lot of great um, and thankful moments that people have expressed in being with you along through the years. So this is the month of gratitude for Soul Advisor. And so let's focus on that. But I just want to also welcome Martine, who's just joined us. And Martine um, has also presented in the last few days. So thank you, Martine. <laughs> Hi, hey, Martin. Good to see you. I love this uh, meeting. They're amazing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fantastic stories. Okay, so um, as we do, I would love to invite everybody just to take a moment of quiet and moment of reflection. And if you would like to, feel free to close your eyes. If not, then don't. And let's just think into where you are today. And see if you can perhaps feel that air on your skin, the skies above, sensing the waters flowing below the ground and all around you, feeling the sunshine, tuning into the trees that are growing, the animals, the insects, the everything, the life force that's around us. And for a moment in whatever way makes sense to you and your heart, please Open your heart and give deep thanks and show respect in whatever way works to the communities and the elders and the traditional custodians who've walked this country for since the first dawn and have looked after it so well and have been in rich relationship to all of this country. And let's hope that we too learn a little along the way, living on this amazing country and um, and make our own connection a bit deeper and that we're able through all that we do as therapists, as people <laughs> in this country to pass on and to represent a little bit of that respect for country, culture and community. So thank you very much. And hello, and hello, Josephine Doyle. Hello. Hello, my friend. <laughs> How are you? Very well, thank you. You look very pretty today in a dress. Oh, thank you. Uh, did you notice that both myself and Jackie, who we are just about to interview, are wearing similar outfits? It wasn't planned, in case anybody wants to ask. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, it just Thanks happened. For me. <laughs> Absolutely. So today we are blessed, really blessed, to have um, Jackie Bushell. Do you say Bushell, Bushell? We need to know that. <laughs> when I'm working in France, it's Bouchel. <laughs> oh, Bouchel. In most other countries of the world, it's Bouchel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, then we've got a spectrum that we could employ. <laughs> um, Jackie, you, as we were talking about, you've been really quite central to a lot of the things that have happened in the last few decades here in Australia in the health and wellness um, movement and our, our coming of age, I guess, of complementary or um, soul-based professions in the healing industry. So I would love you to talk about where, what was your first toe in the door with healing, oh. health and wellness, the very first? Oh, the first toe. Let's see, I was studying nursing and I was one of the last hospital-based trainings, which is rather similar to being in the army in how you're uh, 
caught in the approach to medicine and hierarchy of the hospital. And what happened was I was also on the side. I was involved in more radical environmental politics and um, just a whole range of, of activism. And I went out to an Earth First camp for women in the middle of Victoria somewhere. I, I don't even recall where it was. And we drove out in my little lime green 1966 Vauxhall. This being I was about 20, so it was, it was you know, in the mid 80s and uh, went to this camp. And on the first night we were all sitting around and I was a very righteous 20 year old, you know, the right dreadlocks and the right diet. And we're all very fervent and very sure of ourselves. And and later in that evening, and I'd grown up, I should just digress, in a very, very conservative country town, and then I'd hit Melbourne Uni. So my world suddenly discovered zucchinis, for instance, and avocados and all sorts of extraordinary things I'd never come across before. And I basically, I thought I knew everything. And you know, that, that sort of equated to about everything that could fit into a matchbox. And that night, as we were all sitting around being fervent and just passionate about what we wanted to do for the land, the door suddenly blew open and in strode a woman who to our eyes was old. She must have been at least 60. She had this long grey hennaed hair and she strode in and it turns out, I can't even remember her name, but she had such presence and she strode in and she'd been living in a cave outside of Adelaide somewhere for five years, talking to whales and dolphins. And my world suddenly went from this to, whoa, wow. like, like how on earth do you talk to whales and dolphins? I mean, there's such a thing. And like, what do you do? I mean, how do you live in a cave? What are you eating? And, and you know, where, where are you, what are you doing living in a cave? And my, I, I just boggled. And she stood there in front of us and she said, I am a woman warrior and I'm here to teach you. And she did. It turned out she just heard vaguely that there was a women's earth first camp on somewhere in Victoria. So she said, I just followed my guides and they told me where it was. Mm. And uh, mm. there was something that just sparked to life in me at 20 of I know nothing. I know absolutely nothing. And this woman, her whole world intersected with mine for in this, this split second. And I, I, I began this life of questing and searching of trying to have this sense of how do you live with that level of trust and surrender and that level of, I mean, what kind of level of listening does that take? And I knew it wasn't listening that I was used to. Mm. And how do you develop that level of walking into a, in, through a door and the whole room goes silent and having that level of in yourself. Mm. And that was the beginning of, of a quest of presencing, I guess you'd call it. Mm. And sparked off a lot of journeys and even more questions. That's a beautiful entree, isn't it? And um, I was just shivering then as you were talking because I feel, you know, really it comes down, doesn't it, when you move into your eldership, whatever that looks like individually, that eldership demands a lot of self-respect and it's not egoic self-respect. It's, it's understanding your deep connection to everything as that woman clearly did. So what gives you the presence or the right to walk into a room and say, I've heard that you need me to be here? You know, that is a powerful thing. Yes. And isn't that level of presence and self-trust and self, self-lovingness of, of knowing who you are, no matter what the, I, I think over the years, I've just got more and more vulnerable and more and more having to practice compassion for my own, my own foibles and uh, my own, my own limitations of, of perception I, I think there's a, a grace that comes with oh, the the necessity of learning humility as it happens over the years and there's something about that I don't believe we can be presents to present so much and listening deep with each other or with the land or with plants until we can have that in ourselves that level of uh, 
I haven't quite got a word for that. <laughs> that was a good and word. That feeling of oh, here I stand, here yeah. I stand. Uh, oh well, you know, you. I think you've said it. It's fully presenced, isn't it? It's it's mm. earthed. It's it's actually having arrived. It's that whole thing of what we might have been and what we were grappling at at 20 years you talk about of you know thinking we knew everything and um, having a formula and knowing if I do it I will clearly come out on top of all this and I'll be able to help other people you know that kind of it's not delusion it's just part of what every 20 year old goes through you know and that yes. gives us the courage to take the step out the door away from the nest and to do the thing doesn't it and then you go oh whoops <laughs> I think better listen I gorgeous vital force that I see in so many of these these extraordinary young ones that come in and the the potency of of their conviction and their dreaming and their yes um, I'm going to do this and mm. yes it, it may or may not come out the way they do but that I mean that's just so glorious to witness and uh, that's one of the things that I, I just love about teaching is who comes in. And uh, I mean, I have such a vested interest in, in teaching over these years because it's like, wow, look at you all. You're just absolutely so glorious and gorgeous. Uh, it's such a call to me. I want to be the best that I can or, or to see what can be drawn out of me by their beautiful, rich questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I always feel like I learn so much. You know what, that vulnerability also that you mentioned or <laughs> that radical um, self-forgiveness or <laughs> what is it? living with that radical sense of, of understanding we're flawed and that's perfect too, you know, <laughs> that radical sense of going, you know, I'm, um, the, what you set off in, in your 20s was a very much and always a different story than what you end up with isn't it I think it's a lot less shiny it's a bit more boozed and battered and tarnished and <laughs> angled and what have you and and beautiful you know totally beautiful where we come to so um being able to understand that beauty and just being vulnerable in that knowing that you know judgment is just part of the story isn't it and if we want to take our stories out to a wider audience, we are going to be judged, but we won't die. Yes, isn't that a huge lesson to learn? Mm. Yeah. Mm. You've taken your story wide and far, I've noticed lately. Um, maybe you always have. Um, yes, I've always. Um, actually, it was uh, thanks to Airdrie Grant who Airdrie Grant oh, <laughs> that's the name I haven't Airdrie. heard for a long time <laughs> oh Airdrie yes um extraordinary woman and she hired me at Nature Care College my first year graduating from herbal medicine uh as a lecturer and it's not I'd put out a prayer for uh, a whole new line of of work in in being a herbalist in the world and whatever would be whatever would be best for me and little knowing that it would be public speaking, which <laughs> terrified me beyond anything. Um, I'd, I'm, I have a large part of me is hermit and a large part of me is very happy not to speak for weeks. And so, and I get so tongue tied. At, I'm, I'm horrible at parties. I hide in the kitchen and look like I'm really busy. So I don't have to talk to people because I get so, <laughs> so nervous. So here I was being a teacher and I discovered that it was, the most wondrous thing in the world mm -hmm. and that oh that everybody it just really wants to do the best that they can and everybody just wants to stretch their what it is that they're coming into to experience and mm -hmm. I really learned that I how much that I can trust the people in the workshop that I don't need to give them everything that I can trust them to come up with the most extraordinary ideas and solutions and ways of, of implementing. If I give a little snippet of something, they just run with it. Um, I, I got a wonderful message today. You know, when you have a throwaway line and you just speak something and it just sort of wafts out and, and you never really recall it again and somebody hears it or, or hears it in the way that's meant for them whether I actually said it or not in that way, but that's what they heard. Mm 
And then they run with it and they open doorways and go further with it than I ever would have done. Mm. So I, I love that. I always feel that teaching is, is like a, a multi facilitatory approach. There's me and there's spirit and the earth and the, and the, the people who are there that just in this cauldron together that draw out the words that might need to be spoken or the words that might need to be heard. So mm. it, Oh, I love that. You know, I always say what we're doing here at Soul Advisor is is carrying on a conversation, nothing more. And the same true with the reconciliation journey. We're just carrying on a conversation because it will grow and it, and we will grow with it. Yeah, I love the fact that you said you're some part hermit, and I my mind my visual mind went to hermit crab, and I was just thinking <laughs> yes. of those hermit crabs that get big, too big for the shell, and then it's like. <laughs> that vulnerable moment and go find another show and then oh no I'm about throwing it again <laughs> yes I've moved about I think I'm up to move number 38 in my <laughs> life so I've, I've changed a lot of shells literally and metaphorically <laughs> yeah but but you get brave don't you you know it it's um develops that strength of character <laughs> that goes oh, okay, so this hurts but I can still do it I'll still still get through yeah Yes, and I always feel like a new apprentice in, in each place. It's, okay, well, what is the wind like here? And what does this tree sound like in the breeze? Or mm. how do you grow here? Or, or you're a sunny bit or you're a cool bit on the, on the land. So mm. it, it's really taught me a lot about ways of listening mm. and the ways that um, the, some of the small ways that I see things uh, Actually, I had this great teaching from a lemon tree uh, when, I was, when I was living in um, Deniston and uh, the lemon tree in there it was really sickly. It always had those little stinky bugs on it and Jane and I were always pulling them off and, and feeding it up and snipping it. And I got the message one morning and it said to me, oh, it always makes me cry. It said to me, oh, you inspect me. You never see me. You just inspect me and I realized, oh my goodness, I do. Oh my I do. I look for what the problem is in you. I'm not actually just seeing you, little lemon tree. And it taught me what a difference it is to see the fullness of what's there, the wholeness of something, rather than uh, being trained in in diagnostics, whether that's emotional or physical or energetic diagnostics. And I realized, ah, I need to shift my entire perception. Mm, how beautiful. And thank you. You've just reminded me that you were responsible for that beautiful garden where Adriana now lives. Oh, actually, no, I have to correct you there. Jane is the, oh. I, I love plants, but my partner Jane is the big, big gardener okay. and has a stunning vision and all of the, the technical skills. Um, and directs me a lot so I'll talk to them and connect and make the essences but mm. she's the the garden visionary yeah. well, that, that garden is a very generous yeah. garden when you walk into that garden it, it everything's giving to you you know you really yeah. feel like that and I um and I feel like that response that response that you had to the lemon tree it might have been an aha moment, but it also it really describes beautifully what eldership is, isn't it? Because when we're, or being a healer, actually, or is that the same thing? I'm not sure. I'll ask you that question in a minute. <laughs> but, you know, it's the capacity to see somebody in their context and to feel the bigger them that they can grow into and to help them move into that in whatever way, tweak, word, stance, look, cup of tea <laughs> that's going to take to help them feel safe enough to move into their bigger self and um and that lemon tree was craving that so it had to speak up but you know I know that that plants teach us a lot and and boy have plants taught me that one Jackie I I was not a green thumb but I'm really a green thumb these days <laughs> yes yeah you're listening to them a lot more mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah they, they give um immense immense teachings I think I've most of what I've learned throughout my life has been from making essences with mm. flowers and with the land mm. and uh, often over and over and over again until I can stay in presence with what it is that they're teaching what their particular doorway through into a particular pattern of consciousness is 
Mm -hmm. uh, and some of those teachings are huge teachings around forgiveness and around uh, deep trust or mm -hmm. teachings of how do you stay present in your heart when there's so much going on around you so there's uh, yeah some of those flowers mm -hmm. I've, I've made many times over the years so that I can learn more and more what it is that that mm -hmm. teaching might actually be mm -hmm. Mm, such a privilege to be told, you know, and to be able to bring that forward. Yeah. Yes. And one of the things with the plants is that it's often not just a, a verbal thing, but it's a whole body experience. So in the, the making of an essence where you've got someone in a, in a bowl of water and it gets amplified is that it will ripple through your life and your environment. So there's usually the time before you make the essence and the time after you make it and, the the time during the hours during it so there's it's usually a whole emotional and mental response or how people are responding to you it's like this multi-dimensional hit with what their pattern is when mm. you're open to it uh, so it's a full mm. experiential process which can sometimes be um, absolutely joyful and sometimes immensely challenging as well. Really, um, we had the beautiful Nancy Parker oh, here Nancy, talking to us yes. about um, shell essences <laughs> and she was saying, talking to us about the fact that a lot of those shells that she um, sits in the mangroves and draws essence from are bossy <laughs> and, you know, it's not as if you wanted to do that but you have to do that and so it's, um, you know, I guess it's a very, for me anyway, um, it feels like a very thin porthole uh, at the moment. People like you, people like Nancy, other people who are moving in the energetic fields and bringing through that energy for healing. Um, I think there's been times when we all understood that we have that possibility and that responsibility to translate what we're hearing straight into community you know that's what yarn circles around the fire used to be like at night you know even the little three-year-olds would come in and speak their story and what they'd seen while they were tunneling under the blah 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 you know so country would talk into community daily but um you know it really is rare unfortunately and hopefully getting stronger Jackie I don't know what you think is it getting stronger I really believe that um we're seeing a lot more emphasis on story these days. Everybody wants to be a storyteller. It's become the latest big buzzword. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's what is underlying that, that popularity is a deep yearning for realising how we can engage once again with story. Because when we hear a story about something, whether it's the three-year-old's day and what happened to them or a bigger story like one of the, the great mythic tales, it drops us into the mythic realm and it takes us straight into that relationship with nature and spirit and our heart and, and into that place where we have a, a, a whole body response, not just uh, an intellectual response and I, I feel that that there's a, a craving for that level of communion mm -hmm. and story is one way of enabling uh, that greater connection or that greater reciprocity a reciprocal dance between us and each other as humans and each other as uh, in the other than human realm mm -hmm. so one of the things with story as well and why I loved what you were saying about um, on country everyone gathers to share story because it's so important because I think one of the things that listening for story and creating story is it means that we're reflecting on what it is that we've seen or noticed or felt so mm -hmm. there's a gathering of the the meta narrative of what it is that we've experienced it's not just an experience that disappears rapidly but it's something that's been engaged with and spoken to and threads drawn out of it so there's a a deeper reflection and a bigger conversation that emerges mm. and then that's offered to community and mm. there's the witnessing of that mm. so I feel that through story there's a greater honoring of mm. ourself and each other and 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 earth yeah it, it takes us into nature it certainly does and you know that story that continuing story that unfolding story what have you that conversation is um you know, we tend to think of it, or I always 
by habit think about it as being between different humans but then I'm reminded by my First Nations friends always that any thought you ever have any utterance any sound continues on and you know everything's listening to you literally everything you know like even this table which is made of wood that doesn't you know there's consciousness in everything and that accountability that is brought about by having everything be witness to you your whole body your attitude, your thoughts, your actions and your speech and then having that conversation like singing to country um, and being sung by country, you know, that two-way conversation that goes on between us and and our non-human um, non family. So, I, you know, that's really important. That accountability mm. is something that you talked a little bit with me about previously. Um, how do you see accountability and eldership? Where's the juxtaposition? Well, how do they interact? Mm. I had an experience at, uh, it was last year's Wise Women Gathering, and someone said to me, how are you passing on your legacy as an elder? I thought, oh, I'm not even quite 60 yet. Um, okay, that just reframes me that I'm being seen as an, as an elder. Um, I know my grandfather didn't go grey until he was about 95. So I thought, oh, wow, okay, it reframed my sense of self. But it also really called me up into a sense of I need to have greater respect for my work because I, I continually have a sense of, oh, okay, I'm learning this now and now I'm living out in the desert and I'm a new apprentice yet again and there's this uh, um, deepening bodies of work. So I constantly feel like oh, I'm still learning mm -hmm. and to have a sense of, ah, I need to honour what it is that I've learned and how might I pass this on? So it, it really, the word legacy brought me up into, okay, I need to respect this and then to also to be aware of that this has value in the world and how am I passing this on? What books am I going to write? How am I going to train uh, people people up in a more of a consistent or a more of a structured way. And so there was a sense of, okay, with all that I've learned, then coming into uh, my, my later years, a sense of accountability of how am I going to honour the ones who are coming in front of me? How am I going to honour them? What would be, what will be most useful to pass on down for, for these ones? out of what I've learned. So it's it's really got me pondering and questioning what is what will be of greatest value? What is it that they need? And the thing that I keep coming to is how are we listening? Because there's so much that's shifting and changing in the world, so much that's changing energetically, so much that's shifting on a vibrational level with what it is that we can uptake and how we, uh, how we engage and what's possible now as a human that never used to be before, what people are awakening to. And I realise that a lot of the old rule books just aren't going to aren't going to work these days. Our chakras are changing, our Merkaba is changing so much, the patterns of the earth are changing mm -hmm. and evolving just as much as us. And I realise we're going to need to be able to listen really well to what's here, to what's actually here, and that it may be different from anything that you've ever come across before. Mm -hmm. So how do we listen with the impossible and with the unknown? So mm -hmm. my whole focus has really changed uh, in in this time to how can I how can I develop greater listening and how can I teach that mm -hmm. which is why I've created the school of wild presence which is about basically around the development of perception and shape-shifting our habitual ways of perceiving so my sense of that from that question of legacy and realizing there is an accountability as someone getting older I still don't see myself as an elder uh, so my accountability to what is it that I'm choosing to share that will be of greatest value mm. and how might I do that in a way that will be richest. Mm. 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 That creative process, Jackie, you know, like um, 
it's like we're being forged, you know, we're thrown into the fire of our own lives and it's pretty painful at times. <laughs> Hit with a hammer while <laughs> boiling hot, you know, <laughs> we're being forged, but we're also trying to work out what's our creative process to move with what's being gifted to us currently. And, you know, that lack of sense of sureness is such a healthy thing. Martine was talking about it two days ago, about the creativity and the playfulness that are attributes of, of an el, el, a, a good eldership, you know, our yes. capacity to continually learn, continually engage and, you know, that never stopping kind of thing. And Pauline, you just live that. <laughs> <laughs> to Pauline seems permanently creative to me you know she's always <laughs> bringing in something else and playing playing with everything um so I feel like that's a really healthy attribute for being an elder we've had some beautiful comments here Joe Doyle says oh my so yes exclamation 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 <laughs> so you're hitting a nerve there um Joe did you want to expand on the nerve that's being hit Oh, I am drooling with every single word that is leaving your mouth. I swear. I'm like, yes, yes, punching the air. <laughs> Amazing. You're so speaking to my soul. And I'm just really, I'm celebrating. And I can't wait to meet you wherever you are. I'm coming yes. there. Oh, come out. I'm in Broken Hill. I'm coming. I'm coming retreat. to see you. Come. Yes. I'm so coming to see you. And I'm, going to sit <laughs> and I'm, woman. I'm just going to devour every word. It's so inspiring. And I hear you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I cannot even imagine as a 20-year-old having a 60-year-old woman come in with long gray hair and say, I've been talking to the whales and I'm here to give you messages. I was just listening to my guides. I'd be going, oh, my God, well, this woman has had way too much pot for breakfast. You know? <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is no way that I would have been as expansive as what you were as a 20-year-old. And, oh, if you're writing books, I'm buying them. <laughs> oh, yes. Thank Imagine you. defining yourself as a warrior. I am a woman warrior, she said. Yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, <sighs> that level of, isn't that just one of the greatest gifts that we can give these ones coming in? Here you stand. Uh, it's like a Joan of Arc. I mean, mm. I. That, that level of, imagine having that level of trust in yourself as a 16 year old. All mm. right. Okay. I trust these voices so much. I trust my instinctual wisdom. So I'm going to go to the king and, um, and save France. Uh huh. All right. I can do that. Sure. I mean, imagine having that level of, yes, that beautiful yoga posture that you've got there, that sense of here I stand. I can do none other than speak true. Yes. This is the Dakini posture. Yes. And that Dakini posture was held by 64 yoginis that brought yoga to the world. They were the goddesses, <laughs> the 64 aspects of yoga. And But they were also, that was the warrior pose for the um, Amazonian women from the Russian steppes. So the Russian women from the steppes came down, took Athens by storm, and were beaten back eventually to the Acropolis and held the Acropolis for six and a half months until they killed themselves and buried themselves in that position, warrior women standing up, Whew, you know. Wow. So, <laughs> and also that particular, you know, I wish you know, I was a better note taker in my youth, but I remember going to an incredible seminar where the person's PhD had been about that position and the, then the, and the role of Mother Earth as the deity um, prior to the uprising of religions that weren't earth-based in the world. And she um, she had co collected visuals of all these beautiful little Mother Earth statues from Mykonos, from up in the Andes, from blah, 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 blah. This position, strong. <laughs> yeah, balanced, beautiful, strong, Dakini. That was, um, yes. yeah. Are, are you familiar, Pauline, with Dakini and yoga? Is that yes. Yeah, so I'm sitting here just nodding, going, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. And what I see in that posture as well is they're allowing themselves to be a conduit, heaven and earth, mm. Um, mm. self as divine bridge. Mm. Really, really beautiful. And the one-legged nature of it that, you know, um, I... I draw direct. Uh, really beautiful. And Tanya has said, love your stories, Jackie. You always surprise and inspire. So 
um, you two know each other, don't you, Tanya? Absolutely. We go way, way back, don't we, you gorgeous woman? Mm. <laughs> Where do you, gone. is she here? Tanya? No, she's gone. Oh, she's gone somewhere. She's there, but not there. Come back when you come back, Tanya. And Natalie, do you, do you two know each other? Natalie Bull? And from, from Reiki. Yeah. Oh, you're frozen. Oh, have I frozen? Uh, no, Natalie's frozen. Everyone yeah. else is moving. Oh, no, there you are. You're, yes. you're, you're live now. So you know each other from Reiki? From Reiki. Also, Re Reiki and also, and from doing stuff with Janet too, her partner. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, you're just yes. recently out in the desert doing the Pele drum retreat, yeah. which was beautiful. while yes. I was in the kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> Seeing Get us very well. Mm. Drumming in the desert. Yes. Making a yes. drum. A yeah. Beautiful drum. Yeah. Jane's a, um, a, a, well, she's a, a drum maker and works with rhythm body work and is a, a sound, sound channel. Yeah. yeah. Wow. How special. <laughs> yes. They make a wonderful team too when they work together at the retreat. Yeah. It's beautiful. Mm. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. So eldership, let's come back into all of this and what that actually means to um, to you, Jackie. Like, what, you know, it's hard. I feel it's a funny thing. It's like um, getting people to examine their own belly button, isn't it, when you call it an elder and say, um, what's eldership? <laughs> but I wonder if you've got any thoughts that you'd like to share about how eldership strikes you in terms of examples of eldership or where we're at in the planet at this stage in terms of eldership and our understanding of the need for eldership mm. Stephen Jenkinson is always one of the first that come to mind or grandmother Florida Mayo or some of the the mm. older aunties that I've met or um, doing workshops with Min Maya so I always see them as as elders uh and the other thing is the the invisibility mm. uh, of older people and how generally invisible uh, as we grow older we become in the world uh, in the world in our in our particular culture mm. and the the need to be able to shape shift that around of and I think story is another way in to be able to engage with ah you've got a, a whole ream of stories you're not just you're, you're not just a, a, a sort of blank or someone to be um, treated in a childlike way mm -hmm. so the the lack of presence and respect for el for I'll call it eldering uh, but there's what I'm see, been seeing is there's been more books and conversations around around eldership that's been emerging, and I, I feel that there's more conversations that are opening up mm. us to questioning mm. what it actually is. And we were talking earlier around what leadership is and uh, that place of uh, the leadership that's inherent in elder. And my main, uh, I guess, guidance for what eldering has been is through fairy tales. Hmm. I haven't really had uh, that many uh, very elderly teachers um, a apart, from, apart from books and hmm. uh, primarily. So the elders that I've grown up with have been Baba Yaga and hmm. have been uh, like that meeting with the woman warrior mm. uh, so they've not been ones in uh, in life they've been yeah. an energetic form or some of the the energies that i've worked with in meditation mm. and mm. connected with over over the years uh, and been taught by so to try and see myself as someone coming into an eldering role. I have Baba Yagi here and I have me and there's, there's a, a very, very big space in between. Much as I would adore to have this house have chicken feet, there's a fierceness and a strength and uh, 
I'll come up with a, a word that's not real. Um, or it's like a flexible, resilient, uncompromisingness mm. of uh, no, mm. no, that's not it. You need to do this, mm. it's this and this. There's a, a directness that mm. comes in with them. And there's also, um, I guess, my other elder that I've had great respect for is Granny Weatherwax from Terry Pratchett. Um, and Granny Weatherwax um, doesn't play nice. She really doesn't play nice, but she does what's needed. So there's a, I made a, an essence of a, of a wolf spider a number of years ago who's oh. one of the earth spiders, like a, like a funnel web. Yeah. And, um, lives down in the ground, your little beady eyes pop up. With, you know, little, little, um, there's a fierceness to them. And the teachings um, that came through with that was, are you prepared to cut across what everyone is saying and say, no, this mm. is what actually needs to happen based on this mm. knowing here or cutting through and saying that thing that needs to be said, even though everybody else is pretending the elephant's not in the room, of mm. finding that balance between tax support and then just cutting across. So mm. it's been a teaching of, of the necessity of directness. Mm, mm, mm that has been seems to me as well an essential part of eldering of mm. uh-huh i know i can see all the fairy floss and phew, i'm not going to buy into it so there's a recognition of what stories are at play here mm. and i will speak to that one of the things we often do is we have a whole bunch of stories but we actually think they're true so they become beliefs mm. rather than stories so it's being able to see everything as a story and so, therefore, it's, it's flexible. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we can shift or change things. How do we cut across mm -hmm. what people are holding mm -hmm. to be true? And there's so many stories in the world these days around climate, around um, healing, around how, how do we shape shift those stories into something else? Oh, so much that you've just said. <laughs> But it is, isn't it? It's that capacity to understand that stories serve us and that's what they've always done. And so um, there's a difference between talking to somebody who's speaking from their beliefs, this is real, full stop, no matter whether the, you know, the horses, the <laughs> whether the world stops, this will still be true. Um, you know, no matter the circumstance, this is true. Um, is it? I don't know. You know, like I think that the intelligence comes with understanding that there's a zillion billion stories and they constantly change and that we all have story. And, you know, as Jarrup and Jimper says really, really clearly, nobody's story is wrong, nobody. And so that's a terrifying fact in itself, but somebody has got to be the murderer. Somebody has got to be the massacreist, you know, whatever else it is. Unfortunately, um, people who have taken those roles have had story too. Um, you know, our, our job, I feel, I hope as, uh, people who work in in bringing healing about on the planet is to try and create the circumstances where there's less of those kind of stories and more of the kind of stories that are proactively supportive of each other the planet um, are built on respect and not built on disrespect but you know we have to listen to all stories yeah yes how do we keep a, um, a kaleidoscope mm -hmm. um, one of the practices that I often I've given folks in the past is whatever happens, can you come up with three stories about it? <laughs> At least three stories of what you think might actually be going on. Mm. Uh, because we, we often have the first perception and we have an experience with something and then we interpret it and then that gets laid down as that's actually what happened. Mm -hmm. And that interpretation might be really different from the experience. So how do we keep, uh, keep a, a, a movement and a flexibility around any experience. Mm. Uh, how do we keep um, restoring it and restoring it? Mm. Yeah. Beautiful so, because otherwise it'll get you stuck because you've taken that role and that's mm -hmm. it. End of story. And it's so, you know, like uh, most of us, many of us, myself, <laughs> rely a lot on friends to re restory for us. We go, oh, this just happened. And they said, no, it doesn't. It's a da 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 ba 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 ba. Yes. And, but having that capacity for ourselves to come up with 
differing storylines around an experience is mental health. Yes, absolutely. It gives us, um, it enables us to reframe things. Uh, actually, there's this wonderful story from, oh, I'm just having um, a blank moment there. I'll get back, can get back to you on that one. But one of the very elderly Donald, um, Donald someone or rather elderly American storyteller mm. uh, whose father had half his foot chopped off when he was a kid. Mm. And there's a long story about what happened to the foot. Mm. One of the key things is that when it happened when he was five, Mm -hmm. So the mother sat down and said, tell me the story of what happened. And the next day she said, tell me the story from my perspective. And then from your dad's perspective and from the doctor and from the dog who saw what happened, tell the story from the perspective of the ax. And she made him do it for a year of telling the story of the foot being chopped off from every possible angle. He was so bored with it. And she said, well, it's not just your story, is it? And now it's not just going to be the story of the wounded boy who's a cripple. Mm. Mm. And it wasn't. It became something so much bigger. Mm. Is that Donald Davis? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I've just put his, I'm putting a few links in here for people. Yeah. To, I had never heard of Granny Weatherwax. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry, <laughs> himself. Jerry Pratchett, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, um, <laughs> this is, um, you know, it's fascinating, isn't it, really, that that um, capacity to bring about change, whoever that person was in the story that encouraged the retelling of the story, you know, that that is elderhood, isn't it, to see it from a bigger perspective where you're not stuck and therefore you don't have the need for that person to be stuck and, you know, you can all set sail together <laughs> on yes. the journey. Yes, and that's been so clear in the past few years of, of there's been with so much oppositional views of how do we live in community with oppositional views? How do we still find a way of navigating together um, mm -hmm. within families, with beloveds of how do we ride this ship together? There's a, another great story from, um, from Mary Magdalene mm -hmm. uh, from uh, from one of the apocryphal gospels when they set sail from Alexandria to go over to France mm. and they were put off without any oars or without any sails and so the boat is just drifting everywhere and mm. they they tried everything and loads of ideas and they prayed and they did en all sorts of energetic work and they couldn't work the elementals in order to get where they needed until they came together and they told the story of what was going on and they included the children and they included the sea and they included the dolphins in the sea and they included the raindrops that were coming down until it became a story of everything. Mm. And when they came together as that community, mm. then the boat just moved of its own accord <laughs> until they landed in Marseille mm. and they kept that. teaching. Yeah. Yeah. There's something about that greater dance with with the whole land, and that's what the indigenous people tell us: is that everything is relationship. Nothing is a one thing. Mm -hmm. Everything is an ongoing conversation and a reciprocal dance. It, it's so true, and so important, and so potent, and so healing. And if we don't get back there, we won't get back there. So you know, like that understanding that. Um, that it's complicated and that our First Nations lived in a complex, multidimensional world where everything was relational and had incredible capacity. Like I, I think of the, what are they called? The Inku, I think up in, um, up in near Port Moresby in the hills behind Port Moresby. And they are capable of reciting the names of between 10 to 20,000 of their elders you know, story. so, how, you know, the mind is incredible. And I feel like the trauma that we've inflicted on each other was in often case deliberate. It was a, a part of a war agenda, an enslavement agenda, a power agenda. And by bringing that to bear upon our fellow humans, we have shrunk each other. And yes. we've got so small. And now, you know, we have that stupidity around the jab, you know, it doesn't matter what side you were on but it was a side and you were right and you were wrong 
and you're wrong and I'm right and this is right and that's wrong. And it's all, of course, now up for grabs again, but let's not go to the jab story. <laughs> all the other types of division that we instill on each other, you're this nationality and I'm that, you're this sexuality and I'm that, you're a man, I'm a woman, blah, 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 blah. You know, um, that definition that doesn't give room for fluidity becomes our trap. Yes. Really. It stops conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, a little, actually it was a few, couple of, two, three years ago and I was walking down through the trees where I was living at the time and loving them up and touching them and, and uh, and I was asking a question and wanting an answer. And the response that I received was, well, why do you want an answer? And I can give you an answer. Answers are a dime a dozen. I, I can give you all sorts of answers, but there's not much point really because it's the question that's more important. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel it, I'd, I'd really like to be able to learn to ask bigger questions and to find more ways of asking questions because that will shape the answer in small ways or in big ways and if we can ask really big questions and really exciting questions then it will shape where our our perception is going because I, I, I absolutely believe with you Kate that we hold ourselves far too small and we've got no idea what our true capacity could be mm. and if we ask some big big questions and allow earth-sized dreaming then we might discover something miraculous about ourselves hallelujah let's do that <laughs> i am um, i'm aware that it's very easy to talk and talk and talk with you now i'm going to give anybody else an opportunity in case there's questions burning bright out there because we're only seven more minutes to go we've been raving on <laughs> anybody need to ask questions oh martin says thank you so much jackie i need to go to attend another meeting i will watch the end blessings to everyone <laughs> thank you martin if you're still here um how about any of the other of you any questions burning bright out there or oh, bits to add into your co the conversation this is a juicy one i yeah. saw pauline, pauline. And go up there <laughs> jackie you, oh God, you're just blowing us away. Yeah. Um, it's absolutely amazing, an honour, a privilege. Thank you. And we have become so withdrawn into ourselves, I believe, because of so much fear. And it's people likes of you and the rest of us that have to break this hard nut of fear and Kate, when you said we limit ourselves by the jab, no jab, religion, culture, um, sexual preference, I don't care. I either like you or I don't like you. And I think as soon as we start labelling, and you spoke to um, Jackie about being an elder and not old enough to be an elder, right? <laughs> that really resonated with me. Um, because I'm, I'm only 21, and you know, 21 and gorgeous, really. Uh, you know, there's no age. So, but hello, how are you? Where do you come from? How old are you? Um, and another question I often get, is your hair dyed? Um, well, no, it's still alive. Thank you for asking. <laughs> I love that. You know, the stupidity of what we think is a greeting and it's, it's, an awkwardness and it's a debilitating insular uh, connection and you're just a magnificent and I've really really enjoyed it thank you <laughs> oh isn't it all just about how how we're allowing ourselves to be touched and to touch mm -hmm. and and just the willingness to the willingness to see the beauty in 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 the beings to go oh, God, who are you just sitting there? Um, you know, let, let's just do a, let's just have a little, a little chat, and mm. and find a, and touch each other's lives with, with a with a something, whether it's a tree or a person or, a, or a guinea pig. Um, I think this is something so amazing about what you're describing there of allowing that 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 touch. Mm. Yeah, I really liked your story yesterday, Pauline, when you talked about um, was it Charlie? No, Johnny. Sorry, under a tree, up in yes. Uh, yeah. I, 
I could kind of picture that. And I wonder how you came across that moment with somebody. I can actually recall a cat because I was walking back from the school and I used to look at this man and think, God, what a story under that tree. And one day he just yelled out, know, white girl, come here. And I almost froze and went, oh, my God, um, right. And then I thought, I'll suck it up, sunshine, pull on your big girl knickers. And I said, what do you want? And he said, I want to talk. And that was the beginning of our evening chat. Wow. Yeah, it was brilliant. Mm. Yeah, loved it, loved it, loved it. So, you know, it's the openness, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And letting go of fear. And, you know, sort of that moment of my fear was what does he want? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that had nothing to do with his um, colour or his race. It was a man saying uh, sort of aggressively and me going, oh, my God, is he? what's he going to do, murder me or something, you know, steal something, da, da, da. It was that fear. And as soon as I let go of that, this amazingly splendid friendship blossomed and from the day he died and, you know, it was beautiful. How very precious. Mm. Really, yeah, he taught me so much. He taught me so much. Yeah, in those few short years. How can we get to that point where we stop being so scared of each other? I, I my moment of revelation came in Barnsdale. Bar Barnsdale is it down in um country Victoria, Gippsland, um, and I I spent years in my truck driving around, you know, talking to people, um doing what I did in my truck and hopefully that'll happen to me again. But um, anyway, so I was in Barnsdale coming in at dusk, had to find a place to put my truck, pop up the lid and climb up the little stairs and, and nestle in for the night. And as I drove in, I thought, okay, that's interesting that I'm driving in and I think I can't be out here. What's that about? You know, like, and I thought, you know, I'm not actually scared of the trees or the beasts or the, you know, that's the furthest thing. It's those renegade humans that I'm thinking of that are out on the loose. <laughs> and then I got into town and I was like, oh, which light can I go under? Because, you know, I need to be in a situation where I'm not down a dark alley kind of thing, blah, 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 blah. And I was just like, listen to me after all I know and all I've seen and been like, and here I am in my elderhood worrying about I'm going to be attacked somehow. Yes. yes. And, but, you know, that most people thought I was a nutcase for driving around in a truck full stop. And, <laughs> you know, so it's just like where does that, you know, we've spent so much time humiliating, denigrating, putting down, separating, blah, 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 blah all those words, each other, that it's just part of our patterning and you know I really came face to face with mine that night and kind of went okay you know the only common common um thing in all these fear-based stories that I'm conjuring up for myself is me <laughs> so yes. drop it. You know, yes. if somebody yes. attacks me then I'll just blow a raspberry at them yeah. yes. <laughs> what you did in that moment was that you recognized it wasn't just automatic and oh okay I better find somewhere safe something here you just went ah, oh, I've got this thought, where's that coming from? And how do we bring in that level of, of awareness, of consciousness, of choice to engage with it to so many of our other limitations? I'm curious, what was it that happened for, for you, Kate, and for you, Pauline, in that moment of, ah, here's a story, yeah. ah, it's a story, and I'm still going to do it. Mm -hmm. how, do we, how do we, that's, that's the bit that I, I'm really interested in drawing out. Mm -hmm. How do we enable ourselves to see mm. story mm. absolutely oh my goodness well look we could go on but we won't mm. in an hour mm. and um, <laughs> i'm incredibly thankful for this long and happy long-winded tale about um who you are <laughs> and who we all are and how we come together and it's been beautiful to share time um thank you thank thanks much. it's been great to meet you all and thanks, Kate, and for Deb and Elaine for putting all of this on. It's mm. wonderful to get a chance to meet more of you and what you're all doing in the world and how. We've been calling it the Elder Club because, you know, Merv's just about to present with us, of course, yeah. and Martine right. has already and Pauline uh. has already. Joe seems to be a regular, Tanya's a regular. <laughs> 
And, you know, it's so good to see you here too, Natalie. Thank you for coming along. <laughs> um, so, you know, at the end of all this, anybody that bothered to join us, we're also inviting to the dinner that we'll have in Cambodia. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all just going to yeah. yeah. happen. So we're just cooking that one up. <laughs> you know, Kate, this has been this has been like a religious a religious experience. I've taken down so many notes, and aha, 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 aha. And yes, you know that mm. the the brave the brave mm. people that keep going and keep going. And and Jackie, wow, I'm I'm just. <laughs> Every part of me is so happy right now listening to you talk. Oh, <laughs> it's really oh. an inspiration. And I think um, the path that we are on, if I can just something about being brave, it's that we are we are here to do big things, us people on this path. And if we have something to really be afraid of, we wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't be on this path. We wouldn't be on this journey and being um, feeling like I always feel like I'm supported by divine guidance always. And I, I very rarely feel scared, you know, traveling around the country and living in my van and parked up in the middle of Alice Springs and mm -hmm. had Aboriginal people walk past me all the time. And not once did I feel scared at all, at all. It's mm -hmm. like, why would they, <laughs> wouldn't that be exciting if they did look on my van? <laughs> <laughs> you know? So we're here to do big things and I'm just so excited that I'm listening to you today. I'm thrilled, really. Gushing, in fact. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks, Joe. And um, so tomorrow we have Susie Nelson coming on um, oh. with all that she knows. So that will be a great Fantastic. talk. Monday I become a grandmother, which is very important. I have to on Monday. So there's nothing happening on Monday. But on Tuesday, Merv, we've got you. <laughs> Yay. It'll be great to hear a, a man's voice too. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a few women <laughs> thus far. Um, looking forward to hearing that. Yeah. Oh, thank so, you. Mm. Thank, thank you. That's been wonderful. Oh. Fabulous. Yes, I'm going to press that stop recording button if I can find it. Oh, you know, I have such trouble. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Dun 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 dun. Stop.